Hey guys, and welcome to the show today. Uh, here we've got Jacob. I'm sure you recognize him from previous years of Robot in Three Days, um, but this year we're going to do something a little bit different. We have, I'm sure you noticed, two marked off tables. We've got a red alliance and a blue alliance. We're going to have two FTC alumni at each table, and they're each going to build their own robot. So that's going to be really exciting, and I think we're going to try to start that in about half an hour. For the next half hour, we're going to go through some power play, just um, some basics. We're going to talk about some of the rules that we've noticed after reading through the game manual. And we're going to roll through and look at this uh, FTC um, basic robot and talk about some like basic claw mechanisms, as well as some cool ways you can design claws to use linkages. First off, do you want to grab that cone and we can start talking about some game elements this year? Absolutely. And I mean, game elements this year, am I right? I, it... mm -hmm. So we've got, we've got these cones. We've got, these are, uh, they look like they'd be injection molded, which I'm excited yep. about. Um, so they should be really darn durable. Um, they probably are close to three millimeters thick. Looks about like, yeah. So they are like, you could totally run these over with a robot. You could step on these. They'll be totally fine, which I'm excited about. Um, I think that's going to be really, really good. Th these seem like they're going to be interesting to grab. Like they're going to have some unique claw designs this year. If you're looking at teams using claws, I've seen some like vertical rollers. Um, I think that's gonna, those are also pretty interesting. Those made a lot of sense in uh, the Vex game that I can't remember the name of right now. Dang it. I don't got it either. Put that's it in okay. the chat, please. Yes, the Vex game that <laughs> I'm thinking of. 2017, I think. I yeah. guess I could have just said the year. 2017 is kind of the, the Vex game that ended up being very similar to this. So you got um, rollers that are horizontal to the ground you can roll them over the cone and pick it up. So I think that could be interesting, but you've got to like, I think that might take a lot of mechanism. You've always got to rotate over and then lower a lift down to pick something up. I'm also interested to see, um, we've got some ideas for like, in that year, there's some passive intake options that we saw some teams do, but we may need some uh, some more just like, those, those cones have more horizontal features. So there's more to kind of grab onto. What do you think? What do you? What, where do you think your team's gonna go for intakes this year? Just off the off the top of your head. Um. Well, in the little bit of time that I've had to just kind of play around with the cones, um, it's it's hard. It's putting it's putting the challenge in FTC. I think this year, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit refreshing to be perfectly honest. But um, yeah, I think. I think that honestly, ninety nine percent of robots later on the season will do absolutely totally fine with just a claw. So I think that's a hundred percent viable. Yeah. But um, if, if we can figure out a way to um, touch it and own it, I think that's going to be the best. First thing that comes to mind is maybe, I mean, it's a big element. So horizontal, um, mm -hmm. horizontal rollers. That could be cool. Um, the only thing you have to keep in mind, though, is the the balance point of the cone. This is a relatively low coefficient of friction with the cone, so you can you can you know you can hit it all the way up here before it starts to tip. Yeah. But on the field, it is uh, significantly worse. Like if you if you touch it above above like this line, so like anywhere above halfway, it mm -hmm. just tips right over. Okay, so you might need something that's really low to the ground. Yep, yeah. that'll be interesting. I'm excited about that because that's something that's sort of unique. I don't see a lot of like the traditional FTC and take style where we are get, grab an element and control it and move it onto another platform in the robot. That feels like it would be really difficult this year to keep it upright. Yeah. So no, I think I we're probably like a claw or an intake or something that's directly in interfacing with it. And I think a lot of robots will probably immediately go and score it. Yeah. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that. Um, you need a field accessible claw. If, you, if you're running an intake and a claw, you need your intake to be field accessible and you need your claw to be field accessible because you need to grab cones off of stacks yes. for autonomous, yep. which you can't really do with a horizontal intake, obviously. And you need to get them from the floor and they're not gonna be always consistently placed. Yep. You, know, you have a human player, but... Yep. I mean, at least at least uh, uh, this year, you won't have to 
squeeze the cones before you place them, which is a, <laughs> which is great. I'm glad they're injection molded. Something I'm interested to see is, um, I know there's a lot of thought to like, how do you get these back upright if they fall over? I think I saw some of the fun robot in three days, the first updates now, pushing their cones back into the human player station so the human player can write them. I think that's definitely a forum post. Um, yeah. So I'm interested to see how that ends up working. But I, if that's an option, it probably isn't as fast as some kind of like really good self writing mechanism. But I think that's going to be a pretty hard mechanism to perfect. Definitely perfect. But I think if you're just going for like the odd, like like the odd cone that falls down, it's like, oh no, well we can't get another. I mean, a bunch of boot wheels Interesting. would probably do the trick. Just the whole back of your robot, I'll just put, you know, three, three boot wheels on the back and right at this height. I can I, totally see that working. I had not considered that at all. Even, even on a like servo. That. On a servo, like a super speed servo, you don't need that much torque. I think that's cool. Somebody in the chat mentioned a rotating claw. That makes sense to me. Um, where like whatever your claw is could grab it at an angle. I think that's a cool way to go. Mm -hmm. It might take, it, it'll take some driver practice to do quickly, but I think it'd be fine. For sure. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I really like that idea for writing, writing the cones. You still probably have to turn your robot around. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. But, but the thing is, if they're if they're tipped over, they're going to probably be in center field. Yeah. yeah. And if the back of your robot is where you're writing the cones from and your front is where you're intaking, well, maybe it might be it might not be that bad. OK, that makes sense. I'm interested to see like how important a two sided robot is where you can grab cones from either side mm. uh, or like pass through cones. Um, I think that could be really neat. Yeah, Flipper using a servo, I think it'd be pretty, pretty nice. I don't know 118's 2015 can grab her claw. That's a cool idea. So I think the other thing that I've noticed just from when I've worked with it is just the amount of difference between in um, grippiness, like clean sticky rubber versus dirty sticky rubber is, and like the how clean are the cones. I could see that definitely changing throughout the day and changing how effective just a, a claw that primarily relies on like gecko wheels being really grippy uh, is. I think that could definitely change throughout the day. Absolutely. And that is a lesson to you. Always clean elements. Yep. Always clean your compliant wheels because if you're practicing with dirty game elements, they're not going to behave the same in your intake when you get to a competition. I learned that the hard way multiple years in a row. I was going to say, this feels <laughs> like it might be from experience. <laughs> yes, very much so. We, um, uh, Recharged worked in a very dusty uh, dusty shop for a long time. And yep. it the dust got everywhere. And especially like in um, games with the classic two-inch blocks, like they would get dirty. And then we'd be like, why isn't our intake working? This yeah. is so weird. Um, and it... We just made unnecessary changes because the elements were dirty. But yeah, especially, I mean, because if you have a clean, clean gecko and a clean wheel, like there is a very, very high amount of friction between that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to look at your Skystone claw? I know you brought that and you yes. have some cool design things to show. Absolutely. Um, so um, I brought one of the Skystone claws that I designed uh, because I wanted to um, kind of do a little info segment on over center, um, over center claws. And the importance of this is that, I don't know, some, most people I'd say out there have probably experienced trying to make a claw um, and you know, you're powering the servo into the object huh. and eventually, something breaks in the servo. Over center linkage claws. This is what I believe is the ideal way to use a claw in FTC when you're limited to servos, that is. Yep. Um, and this was a side gripper for Skystone, so it would, it would come down and over the block, just like this, in the auto line. And then around here, right, right when we're over a stud, then the servo would go all the way and you know 
sometimes you would have a claw that goes to here, maybe in, in the linkage position to grip the block. And that's, you know, serviceable, it works okay. But this one goes another extra about 20 degrees and lays flat against this stopper piece here. So the linkage and the servo horn almost form a parallel line, but in the opposite direction. So what that means is this servo, not powered, It takes, it takes a good bit to get it out of there. Right. So and basically what we're trying to do is by getting those linkage arms to be parallel, we're getting to the point where we're not applying any torque to the servo. Yes. This is, this is actually, I said this is, this is the ideal way to do it. This is an unideal way to do it because there's no servo block. So the, the flip side of this is that now all of the, ser all of the force going this way is pretty much directly imparted as side load on your servo shaft. That being said, this servos that I, that we ran on this never broke. Um, and I think a lot of that can be contributed to, um, using a compressible grip material here. Um, and that allows you to actually go over parallel a little bit on here and just get that compression on this. Um, uh, I'll need to, uh, go and look back at what the actual name of this is later because it's a uh, it's just alphabet soup but um, it's like a foam rubber tape uh, and it's it's about a quarter inch thick and it just has enough compression to conform to contours of the block and and whatnot so yeah. coincidentally the skystone blocks are four inches wide and uh, the cones have a, a four inch diameter base so this actually would work if you wanted to grip the cone base. And when I say it works, I mean it works. Yeah, that works pretty well. So yeah. you need to mount that with the servo facing up, kind of. Yep. You, need to get, you need to get it close to the ground. It would, it would, be, it would need to be too close to the ground, Probably. I think, is, is the issue there. Um, however... Nope, I'm not muted. Okay, sounds good. All right, another yeah. mic switch, yep. Um, I do think that this, uh, type of design, maybe, um, with some sort of contour to the, to the cone, um, uh, but using this, this same, um, uh, linkage design as well as the compressibles to grip, you know, near the midsection of the cone would also work really well. Um, so I don't think we're going to use any of this compressible stuff, um, on the robot in three days. However, we are gonna try our best to replicate this type uh, of physics, I guess, um, on at least my team's robot in three days robot. We'll, we'll see about the other, we'll see about the other teams. They, they, might, they might do something else, but. Oh yeah, put a wheel or bearing on the claw so it can ride the ground. That is a good idea. I like that a lot. I think that would be really, that would be really sweet. Um, the other cool thing that you can do with this sort of linkage is you can have, uh, if I grab one real quick. Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll wait on that. But um, you can have a two sided um, servo horn rather than a one sided, and you can have two linkages attached to it, which means that you can activate two claws with linkages at the same time with one servo. So if you wanted to have a servo in the back here behind, behind the cone and two like gripper pads, you could activate both of those with the same servo with two linkages and have it be over center at the clamping point, which I would really like to see if I can, if, if we can get something working that mm -hmm. uses that style of claw. Um, That'd be really sweet. So do you have any questions in the chat? Uh -huh. Put a wheel or a bearing on the claw so it could ride yeah. on the ground. That makes sense. That's a really nice way to control like the height. Um, and there was one more in there. Was have gravity or a spring push it to the ground? Yeah, I mean, sure. kind of, kind of treat it like a like an odometry pod, I guess. Do an omni on it and a and a um, and a spring, like just spring into the ground. That's actually that's a fun idea. I kind of like that. I I do kind of like that, where it'll be as close to the ground as possible. Like at any given time, no matter if you lift tight, that's kind of cool. 
Yeah, and then you also get the advantage of it technically not supporting as much weight as it would if it were solid mounted. Yeah, you could spring that uh, rotation to where it, ex it exerts a very little amount of load on the ground with that wheel. Because the, th the thing you want to keep track of, and you get some of this with like a dead wheel odometry, is the more wheels you have supported, supporting your robot weight without being driven, the less traction you get with your other wheels. Basically, you're reducing the force on any other wheel by pushing something into the ground. So a lower a lower spring tension there. It, that'd be really easy to tune something that just pushes really lightly on the ground to make sure it stays there. Mm -hmm. That would be a really cool option. And you contrast that gripper with the builder gripper with two compliant wheels. So the idea, it, so yeah, I mean, you can go through the, okay. The reason we use compliant wheels on this gripper is to give us a little bit of wiggle room um, with the exact position we have to set the servos to in order to reduce their current drop. So if we were to grab this cone with these two servos, we want to set the servos in position to where they are compressing the gecko wheels partially, but not all the way. That gets you um, a little bit of compression. And what that does is it you're setting a very particular amount of load on your servo. So your servo's current draw is going to be um, proportional to your torque. So as you increase the torque load on the servo, you're going to draw more power. Um, because motors are never 100% efficiency, some of that power is always going to go into heat. And you're always going to start heating up your servos. And there's a point where that heat can damage the motors. Um, you basically end up hurt, uh, damaging the commutator or the brush inside the servo. And what that'll look like when you permanently damage it is you'll have a spot where your servo can't go. So it might not be, if you start up the servo at that dead part, it may not be able to move off that dead zone. Or you might see it move in to try to grab something and then spring back and then move in to try to grab something and spring back. So that's what we commonly associate with like a burnt out brush or a burnt out commutator on a servo. So we're getting part of the way there by controlling the amount of torque load on the servo. We're basically limiting how much power the servo will apply to hold that position. If we were not to have that limitation and we just set the servo to try to close all the way, it's going to apply literally as much power as it can to get there. It's going to apply all of the torque it's got. And at that point, since it's not moving, it's going to have its full stall torque of current. Uh, so it's going to apply its full stall torque, so it's going to pull it's full stall current and it's going to heat up really high, really quickly. Um, basically, because we're not applying, in that situation, we're not moving the load. So we are not creating any mechanical power. So we're 0% efficient. All of our energy that we're dumping into the servo is going into heat. So if you have a 3 amp servo running at 5 volts, we have 15 watts of power and that 15 watts of power Electrical power is just turning into 15 watts of heat that your servo has got to just dissipate or keep rising in temperature. That was extremely insightful. That was really I learned, detailed. I learned so much in like a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I annoyingly, like literally right before the stream, erased my motor curve that was on the whiteboard or oh, I would have just no. walked over and showed <laughs> the motor curve. That's a video. I did that as a kickoff presentation, basically. Um, but that's a video I want to make soon. We'll see. Yeah. So like Ethan said, TLDR, or about halfway to what's behind this with using compressibles on that. Yeah. Significantly, significantly nicer to work with if, you're, if your claw is compressible. Right. And th these do a pretty decent job. You can absolutely get it to let go. Um, but I, it, the other nice part about this is you can really quickly prototype it by just holding the wheels at the position you want. We can pick basically how much force we want to apply by changing that position. And then yeah. So that's faster than that arm will will rotate just under motor power and it holds in there fine. Yep. Are you gonna start selling more wearer tools like what you have on the table? We've got the round round handle wearer tools here. These were actually the first wearer tools we bought. Um, we probably aren't gonna start selling these because I like the T-handles better. I think everybody I've talked to likes the T-handles better, but um, it's hard to beat just having more tool options. Sometimes it's nice. So. These are out there. There are good options. You can buy them from other sources, but we're probably going to stick to the T-handles um, there. And then we've got our, our small cast wrench, which is pretty useful most of the time. I've got one I use all the time for my 4mm nice. uh, 
or M4 nuts on my RC car. They're fantastic. If both arms of the gripper are moving, would it be difficult to pick up cones that are not standing? Probably. This is really not ideal. So the story behind this robot is this is the robot that we have you go through and build in the Rookie Handbook. Um, it's got a six wheel drive, it's got a, a single motor arm, and it's got those two claws. This is built out of all parts that were in the master kit. And it, it's kind of designed to be almost season agnostic. It ends up making a lot of sense for this year. Uh, I rolled up to a kickoff with it and they were like, did you know about the game early? Like, how did you build this robot? Um, I designed this robot like three years ago. <laughs> so I definitely did not. Um, but it ends up being pretty close and I think you can score on at the very least the low goal. I think you can barely make the high goal with this. I think some method of like directing the cones into where you want to grab it with a claw makes a lot of sense where you can drive up to them and, and grab them. But I don't, this really would probably want an additional mechanism to write cones or like we talked about earlier, potentially push them into the human player station and have the human player write the cone if that's possible. Actually a really easy addition to this robot yeah. would be maybe some go tube and a clamping mount just to put okay. this plate in like inset in here. And then this actually conforms to the cone with a pretty decent that amount is, of wiggle room. That's so, pretty, it's pretty darn close, yeah. I don't know exactly if it would work fantastic with this, but if you take something like that and then you can drive up to the cone right there, yep. and then you have a back plate yep. to also press against, that's nice. That could definitely increase the stability there. Yep, that'd be a great opportunity to use some of that, you know, rubbery tape as the to add to this piece of channel to make it more exactly, grippy. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, right now we're kind of still beta testing the rookie handbook. So if you shoot us an email to uh, tech at gobuilda.com, we'll send it over to you. Uh, but yeah, we're looking for a lot of feedback on that as much as uh, basically as much as you guys can can share. I wonder how much, how, so we just need some go tube to come off the back of this. I think we could even do it with a shaft beam. Interesting. Or a square beam. Okay. I, I mean, you know. I think. For, for a quick prototype. Yeah, let's, let's see if we can bolt it on there. I think that's cool. So. Well, yeah, we might have to remove the servos. Potentially. To get to there. That's but, fine. We can do that quick. Yeah. Um, and then uh, as far as expanding on, um, the uh, difficult to pick up cones that aren't standing question. If you had something like what we were talking about with this, mm -hmm. um, where it's really close to the ground that grabs the base. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend grabbing the base. I don't know if that's a, an ideal option. Yeah. But if you did have something like this, uh, yeah, th you're at this point, you're just operating on the assumption that you're only collecting from the stack or the human player. And honestly, I know it's a debate but I think that's totally fair. I think that's a fair assumption for 95% of cases in this game because... Um, You've got, is it 30 cones per alliance? 30 scorable cor cor cones? 30 or 32, it's something yes. like that. I think it's 32 total and you've got the two signal cones that you can't score. Yeah, and, and though I do think at the top level, it's very viable um, for teams on an alliance to run out of cones because I, I did the math mm -hmm. it's like six second cycles okay to to completely run out of cones okay and definitely possible possible but unlikely until i would say march yes mm, you're I, gonna I have think... to have four good robots all at the f on the field at the same time well yeah but even just two because they're alliance specific that's true so. yep and that's probably where you'll see the highest scores is two really good robots. I mean, that's always where you see the highest scores. But I think because at that point, if you've got two really good robots and two like just not as competitive robots, you'll see high scores because those two uh, really high level robots probably aren't going to be saving a lot of those cones for uh, creating the circuit in end game. Because that's going to be, that's a lot of points when you're talking about getting close to scoring all of them. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, Again, 95% of the time, it's going to be faster just to go and grab a new cone than, yep. than you know, tip, yep. than tipping a, a different one. It's... Robot Scout Squad asked if you can. I did, I did this when I had this robot driving. You can. So basically, you put the gecko wheel on the edge of the cone, 
and push down and drive backwards. It's way darn easy. <laughs> it's so much easier when I'm holding the robot with my hands and I can make the arm go exactly as fast as I want and I can make the drivetrain drive backwards exactly as fast as I want. Um, like that is doable, but it's tough. Um, I think that something that is, you probably could get that down to where you could automate it. No, it's gotta you be still like have one. to line up to it though, yes. which is, I mean, and, and I feel like the consistency would be a little bit better on field tiles. You get a little yep. bit of compression. Yep. But... You get more just, yeah, that makes sense to me. You get a little bit less, you know, uh, absolute precision that's required out of the system. Let's see. Is there anything else you're really anxious to talk about before we get started for about three days? Me? No, but okay. is there anybody in chat that has any questions yep. before we swap over to the main event? I guess? So basically what will happen is we'll, we'll cut out and we'll go. We won't be live for a few minutes. We're going to get everybody set up and then we're going to get started on the main event. So um, stick around for probably five or ten minutes. We probably will roll the intro again. And then this will be a totally separate stream specifically for Robot in Three Days. We'll introduce to all our guests and that kind of stuff. Uh, Ethan, what do you think about turrets this season? I think they're going to be pretty cool. I could totally see a lot of robots with turrets. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that more yeah. in the brainstorming phase. So with that, we'll see you guys in just a few minutes. And we'll head out.